Well, it is good to see each of you here this morning. We are blessed, aren't we? To have a God we can trust and obey. A God we can come together this morning in fellowship, to worship, to sing praises to, to pray to and communicate to, to draw near. With a true heart and an honest heart, we are blessed to have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in whom we can put our full confidence our full trust in. <clears throat> and it is the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in which we've been studying and looking at specifically here on Sunday mornings this year in a hope to look at and get a fuller grasp or a reminded grasp of the harmony between the three. And as we have looked at that and as we have examined that, and seeing how the three are one, that they are united in every way, whether it be in word or deed, in action, whatever it is, they are in complete unity, complete harmony. And yet within that harmony, as we have been discussing, there are three personalities between that, within that one harmony, that single unity of deity and God. There are three distinct personalities that have different roles and do different things within our life. Now, obviously, as we have said, because of that unity, there is overlap. And we've been looking at specifically the personality known as the Holy Spirit or God, the Spirit, as one way or in different way. We've seen the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is he who has and does love us as much as the Father and the Son, who has done just as much for our salvation as we looked at a few weeks ago. Then the Father and the Son, all three united in their role to help us get to heaven. And this morning, we're going to continue that study, continue looking at the Holy Spirit, in particular, by examining that which we or that which I have in passing or for just a moment in time discussed the spirit and his indwelling if you have your bibles or if you look up here on the screen we're on I want us to look at Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 11 Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 11 you have however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. One of the things that we mentioned and studied and looked at was there is no doubt and there is no argument in the brotherhood, no discussion whatsoever about the reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit nor the indwelling of Christ or the Father within the child of God. The question has always been, how exactly does that take place? What is the avenue by which the indwelling incurs? And though we are not going to go into all the specific details, mainly because as uh, one studies this, they'll see there are so many variables in line. We will discuss the two main ideas and thoughts behind it and how even within those two doctrines, we can be united. That those two doctrines concerning the Holy Spirit and how he indwells the individual Christian are not mutually exclusive when it comes to fellowship. <clears throat> and so with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at our first point. If you have your hand out there, let's talk about that controversy. And that might be the wrong word, but at least the discussion that goes on between 
the two doctrines on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have those who hold to the idea of the figurative indwelling. <clears throat> this figurative indwelling is oftentimes called the representative view or indwelling or the word only view of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is an the second most popular view about how God, the Spirit, dwells in mankind. <clears throat> it has been and has been held, this figurative indwelling, representative, or word-only view, by many past faithful preachers and teachers and students of God's Word. Some Names that you might be familiar with who have held the idea of the figurative view on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Alexander Campbell, H. Leo Bowles, Foy Wallace Jr., Guy N. Woods, Perry Conklin. And that's not an exhaustive list, of course. There are many others. Those of past <clears throat> large names in the brotherhood have held to the figurative or word only as it is most often used, word only view, those that hold this view. Typically, and like with anything, there are nuances between uh, certain members and, and what they might believe in certain technical or technicalities within this view, but typically, those who hold this view believe that when a believer allows God's word to live within them and then become a Christian, it can then rightfully be said that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwells in them. That through the word and as we allow the word to live in us, to be a part of our lives. That which was prophesied about, by the way, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and following, God prophesied and said, when this new covenant comes, my word will dwell where? In the heart of man. And so the word only view, or the figurative view says, well, as we have that living word then abide in us, not just be a part of us, but abide in us, dwell in us, then representatively through that, the Father, the Son, and specifically here the Spirit dwells in the child of God. And they'll say, for example, one illustration given of this idea says, well, when you look at somebody or you know somebody and their family history and you say something along the lines of, I see your father in you. <clears throat> You're not saying that you believe or see that person's father literally dwelling within them or in them, but yet you see the characteristics, maybe the mannerisms or the training in which one received and grew up under in that one, in the child of that father. And so they'll say, well, this is a, a good way of illustrating or trying to define what they mean by word only or figurative view. As the word of God dwells in us, as we are filled with the word of God, as it lives within us and abides within us, so does God. They'll use passages such as Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, and Colossians 3, 16 to demonstrate or point out, as they would say, it as possible proof text for this. In Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, we read this, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll say, well, if you look at this passage, when we are filled with the Spirit, that is when we can address one another in psalms and hymns 
in spiritual songs. We'll say, then we go look at the parallel, if you will, there in Colossians 3.16. And he'll say, look what it says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so the argument goes, see, here we have an example of the who, the Holy Spirit being filled in us, and the how that takes place by allowing the word of God or the word of Christ to dwell in in us richly <clears throat> and so the conclusion there is and, and this is just a sample obviously of the passages used but the conclusion then is that well this is through the word only again as we mature in the word as we gain more knowledge and as we pray for wisdom and we uh, abide in that word more and we live with the according to the word of God, and we gain that wisdom and that knowledge and all those things, the more mature we are, the more we draw closer to God, the more he dwells in us, so to speak. The other doctrinal consideration, instead of the figurative indwelling, the literal indwelling. This is most often called the personal indwelling or personal view of how the Holy Spirit indwells. And again, this has been held by great faithful men, preachers and teachers and women uh, throughout time and, and history. Gus Nichols, for example, Hugo McCord, Roy Lanier Sr., Johnny Ramsey, some pillars in the faith from years past, all held to the literal indwelling thomas b warren another one or the personal indwelling again as it's sometimes called what does this mean well instead of figuratively obviously as we just discussed those who hold to this view believe that at baptism when one obeys the gospel that the holy spirit literally takes up residence within the believer that when we obey God's gospel plan of salvation and we come out of that watery grave, at some point within that process of going in, in obedient recognition to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in that watery grave, that the Holy Spirit, as we talked about a few weeks ago, in sanctifying us and, and sealing us and all those things, he then literally takes residence with the believer he resides then for the rest of that child of god's life with him or with her in more of a though spiritually speaking but in a literal sense and the most common argument that is started out or shown for this particular view looks at Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off. Notice, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Now anyone who's done a study on the gift of the Holy Spirit sees and notices and finds that that phrase is used to literally speak of the Holy Spirit in other places. That the gift is himself or is in fact himself that is being given. And so the view holds that since we read in Romans 8, 28, that God calls every Christian then everyone must then receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit himself. That every Christian that is called by God, and again is every Christian, who obeys God's gospel plan of salvation, receives this gift or the dwelling of the Spirit of God. 
So the question of literal or figurative indwelling has gone on for centuries. It can be traced back to, to just a few years after the Apostle John is said to have died. We start seeing writings and questions and people from a quote-unquote theological perspective asking the question, is he literally indwelling or does he figuratively indwell? And you see the same arguments that are presented uh, for the most part even today. For example, those who are figuratively say, well, we know it says that the Father and the Son also dwell within us, but then we see clear passages that point to this being through the Word. The counter has always been, yes, that's true, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, that's not the case. It's never pointed out or said that it is only through the Word like it is with the Father and the Son. And so there's that back and forth and back and forth. It has only been in more recent times that those who held one view or those who held the other view made it a fellowship issue. In other words, that whether it was the word only or the personal indwelling, that there was a statement made, well, if you believe this, you cannot be right. You are a false teacher. And therefore, being a false teacher, believing in false doctrine, your chances of going to heaven are greatly reduced, if not nullified completely. And therefore, we cannot have or be in fellowship with one who would teach or believe or think in whatever opposition is being discussed. Again, that is a relatively new take on it. As I said, for centuries, people have brethren have in harmony disagreed on how this could be the case but never made it a fellowship issue now why has it become such unfortunately as you and I know when man gets involved in things we have a tendency to either not go far enough or go too far in trying to be right. Not right with God necessarily, though that is usually the said idea behind being right as they see it, but to simply be right. They don't want to be wrong or don't like the idea that they might not have all the information that is available or that there is information not available and therefore a complete and thorough understanding can't be met. And so they, as man does often, <clears throat> some of the brethren, or some of the brotherhood, excuse me, started discussing or taking the personal indwelling in particular to fall. We start seeing about 20 to 25 years ago those like Mac Deaver and others who believed in the literal, personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit saying things like this. Well, because one of the arguments was, well, if he's in there, what does he do by the word only group? And we'll talk about that next week. And so people started saying, well, there has to be something he does. And so you started seeing things like, well, he illuminates the scriptures for the child of God. Now I'm sure many of you right off can see the dangers in such ideas. If God is willing to illuminate for some, why not others? Why isn't it then that the Holy Spirit, if he's personally or personally indwelling everyone, why are they not illuminated all to the same degree? Why are some who we know are faithful to God get confused on the scriptures from time to time if the Holy Spirit himself is illuminating, giving this special understanding to Christians concerning God's word? And so from that and other things like baptism of the Holy Spirit that eventually came forth from this as an additional thing, there is this 
pushed by this few <clears throat> to teach what is obviously false, as we'll talk about in a moment. But unfortunately, all who got grouped into, or all those who believed in literal, and for years had been fine with everyone else, was now considered a heretic and believing the same thing. And thus the fellowship issue grew and came about. So with that in mind, what is the undeniable truth when it comes to the Word and the Holy Spirit? And when it, how it interacts or how He interacts with us and the Word. Can there be a harmony in these two things? What can we look to Scripture specifically and determine when it comes to the Holy Spirit indwelling and His Word? Because as we've said from the very beginning, when it comes to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, as all three we've said are found and discussed within the uh, context and reality of the Word, the Father is the architect, the Son lived it, and the Spirit inspired it. When we look at all of this reality and how they are united 100% in this and harmonize 100% in this, what can we know? What, is un what we know is undeniable about the Word, the indwelling, and the Spirit. The Spirit does not go beyond the Word He inspired. That is an undeniable truth. <clears throat> And so, if we hear someone start preaching or teaching, especially in a public sense, obviously, but as Romans 14 says, in a weaker sense of faith, this doctrine, maybe they got caught up in it, and they're studying it and trying to talk to you about it, and we gent more gently, obviously, handle that situation. But for those who would be public about it and, and not willing to listen, study, or are more likely willing to deny this reality, that's when we need to be more upfront and deal with the fellowship issue of this reality. The Spirit does not go beyond the Word. There is nowhere in Scripture where as Mac Deaver and those who have become his disciples would suggest, there's nowhere in the scriptures that says the Holy Spirit gives special, a different ability to understand the scriptures than anyone else. That he illuminates then, makes known in a special way for the child of God, and is specifically the one who is really dedicated, is typically how this goes, to that. The Spirit will not ever go beyond the Word. Now, as I said, one of the offshoots of this, from most who have started going down this illuminated Word idea, is this idea that we are not only baptized in that watery grave, but that we also go through the Holy Spirit baptism at the same time. Now, again, it's not rocket science to see why this would not be the case. Paul already eliminated that in Ephesians 4, 4 through 5. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, which is it? Are we baptized in that watery grave and the Holy Spirit baptism? That would be two baptisms, or are we not? Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, already put an end to that discussion. When he said, at this time, and moving forward, were there other baptisms? Sure, there is the baptism of fire. There was a Holy Spirit baptism. There were several, John's baptism, prior to this point, sure. And were, especially John's baptism, were Paul and the other apostles, disciples, having to deal with those who are still being taught that erroneously after the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, sure. 
Acts chapter 18, the end, and Acts chapter 9, 19. Hence why Paul would make it abundantly clear that now there is only one, which is fully discussed in Romans chapter 6, in the entirety of that chapter, but specifically chapter 3 through chapter, or, excuse me, verse 3 through verse 6. The Holy Spirit cannot illuminate an idea that is not found in his word. He cannot give a special understanding beyond what he himself inspired. And when it comes to this idea of illumination, notice what Jesus said in John 8.32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Who can know the truth? Is it just the apostles? No. Was it just those other than the apostles who were with Christ when he made this statement? No. Everyone can know the truth. John 17, 17, your word is, or sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Everyone can know God's word. It's not limited just to the child of God, and specifically those who are somehow extra dedicated and therefore have a special illumination. In fact, in Psalm 119, verse 130, we see this about the word of God. The entrance of your the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the only the special selected few. No, he says even the simple. That word simple there means those who are not of high intellectual intelligence. And the idea is everyone. He's not trying to make fun of anyone. God's not saying well, I, this person is just not very smart. No, he's just saying that, listen, every single person. You don't have to have an IQ that's considered to be a genius or this special illumination. It is the word that gives understanding to everyone. <clears throat> In fact, I would go so far as to say the simple have a much better chance of understanding it than the highly intellectual more often than not because it's written so plainly that many of the highest of intellectuals struggle with the simplicity of the gospel. So as we can see, there will never be a point, nor should any doctrine ever be taught, that would say this Holy Spirit goes beyond the word he inspired. Why is this the case? <clears throat> because the Spirit works through the Word. Again, if the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in perfect harmony, and the Father is the architect of the Word, the Son is the one who lived the Word, and the Spirit is the one who inspired the Word, and they are in complete and total harmony, not going beyond what the other has done, and are in a perfect circle of unity. Then God's holy writ makes it abundantly clear and succinct that the Holy Spirit is not going to go outside of the harmony and therefore works through and with the Word. And this is bore out throughout Scripture. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? In Galatians 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faith is an aspect, a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And yet in Romans 10, 17, we see that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. The Holy Spirit will always work through the world. We are born of the Spirit through the Word of God. 
In John 3 and verse 5, we remember the infamous exchange between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We are born of the Spirit. There's no doubt about that. But we also read in 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, the Holy Spirit always works through the word. We're led by the Spirit through the Word of God. Romans 8, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. In Psalm 119, 105, we all know what it says. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is through which the Word of God is through which we are led. It is the Holy Spirit who leads us through it. We're sanctified, as we saw a few weeks ago. By the Spirit, again, through the Word. Romans 15, verse 16, to be ministers of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In John 17, 17, we read, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Start seeing a pattern, don't we? The unity between the Spirit and his inspiration. We're washed by the Spirit through the Word. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Of course, Ephesians 5, 26, that he that's God might sanctify her, having cleansed her, or excuse me, Christ might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of with the word. The undeniable truth is this. The Holy Spirit will never, ever go beyond what he inspired and will work completely and thoroughly through his word. He will never go outside it, nor break it beyond it, nor fall short of it. He will always work through his word. You cannot have one without the other. Now, we might look at that and say, well, that sure looks like the word only. And it can appear that way. And for those who would come to that conclusion, it's not a fellowship issue. Nor could those who would make a discussion in the personal indwelling, one of which I hold as most likely in my opinion, as possible. I have several friends who believe both ways. Some word only, some the literal and personal indwelling. One thing I'm thankful of, because none have gone beyond what God has said or made the Holy Spirit go beyond his word, we've made it a fellowship issue. As long as we keep in mind that boundary, that undeniable truth, then the how the Holy Spirit indwells is not of huge significance. Would we like to be able to say there's enough evidence one way or the other to prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt? Sure. But there have been far too many faithful brethren through the years, men and women alike, who have come down on both sides, and that tells me, and has for centuries told just about everyone else, that there's obviously not enough information delivered to us to determine exactly how the indwelling takes place. Hence, why it should not be a fellowship issue unless other doctrinal factors are brought into it that are indeed and can indeed be proven and determined to be false. <clears throat> Next week, we are going to look at 
if he does indwell, and since he does, as we've seen and shown over and over, and that should be without question or without doubt, since he does indeed indwell, next week we're going to look at what does that mean for us then? To know that the Spirit of God dwells in us, whether it be figuratively or literally, either way, it's important for us to understand what that means. How does that affect our lives? How does he work in our lives as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have all been said to do so? We'll begin looking at that. I don't know if we'll cover it all, but we'll begin looking at that next week. But let it be said, and let us never find it the case that we are disfellowshipping or not in fellowship over the issue of the mode <clears throat> by which the Holy Spirit dwells. There's just too much at stake. And as you and I have seen over and over, and as we even discussed this morning in Bible class, as Hayden read and brought up, we're not to be quarrelsome over those things that we're just not given enough information on. We're to help, we're to encourage and to build up and those who are more faithful in their or strong in their faith are to help the weak and weak in the faith are to help the strong where they're what strong. But let it not be the case that we go beyond God's word and we teach something that God has not taught. So this morning, as you reflect upon your walk with God, whichever avenue or side you come down on how the Holy Spirit dwells, I pray he does it indwell in you. That you have obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation and that you are living that word, his inspired message in your life. And in so doing, having the best life here on earth, not the easiest, but the best. And we are told as God's children, those adopted into his family, to test our faith, to make sure we are in the faith, to make sure God dwells in us. That our walk with him, not just while we're here, but as we go outside those doors, that our walk with him is pure, is sanctified and set apart from the world, that we are a light to this dark world. If you look at your life and see that's not the case, let's make the change. Go to God, correct what needs to be corrected, and then if you need help in walking that and, and getting through it, as we all do from time to time, let us help. Let us be that encouragement, that strength, that hug, that prayer, whatever it is. Let us be that for you. Let us love you. And let us show you God's love through us. This morning, if you need that love, you need to feel God through our actions with you. This morning, let us do that. But we can unless you come forward now and let us know as we stand and as we sing.